In this edition of Focus on the Fighter, we return once again to the heavyweight division. You know, I've always appreciated and been intrigued by Joe Lewis, not just because of where he came from, but what he came to represent. Not unlike many other fighters of this era, Lewis was born into extreme poverty, the son of a sharecropper and one of eight children. His dad was even institutionalized in a mental asylum early in Lewis's childhood, and his mother and family were pretty much driven out of the South by racial persecution. They settled in Detroit, and this is where Lewis would discover his calling to be a fighter. You know, it really began when Lewis's grandmother, in hopes of giving Joe something to aspire to, gave him money for violin lessons. She found a way to scrape together a quarter each week for this, but having ideas of his own, Lewis used the money to rent a locker at Brewster Gymnasium. Lewis was able to get by with this for a while by hiding his boxing gloves in a violin case. But when he was discovered, fortunately, his grandmother understood his desire and allowed him to continue. Joe had a fairly brief amateur career with just over 50 fights, but won several titles, including the Detroit Golden Gloves Novice Division and later Open Championship, as well as Chicago's Tournament of Champions and United States Amateur AAU Tournament. Oddly enough, in spite of his amateur success, when Lewis's managers took him to famed trainer Jack Blackburn, he wanted nothing to do with Joe. He basically said, there's nothing I can do with a black fighter. You see, no black heavyweights were given a chance after Jack Johnson. As much good as he did to advance the Af African American community, he did equally as much harm. Johnson had flaunted his success in front of the white public, he'd openly taunted his white opponents, and inspired hatred. With Johnson's exit after losing to Jess Willard, allowing another black athlete to fight for the heavyweight championship of the world just wasn't going to happen. And it didn't for nearly two decades. You know, from my perspective, there were two contributing factors that would force that change and open the door for the Brown Bomber to tip the scales in his favor. First, at the time, African-Americans were devoid of a hero. Lewis's early success as a professional caught their attention and provided hope. The community raised him up and made sports writers take notice. He sold tickets, sold papers, and no matter what color or race you were, that equaled dollars. Lewis won 10 of his first pro fights by knockout, which gave him enough credibility to be signed by Madison Square Garden promoter, Mike Jacobs. The second contributor to Joe's acceptance was that his managers established a PR plan that would present Lewis as being the exact opposite type of athlete as Jack Johnson. They established a specific set of rules for Joe to follow that would ingratiate him to all sports fans. These commandments were, one, never have his picture taken with a white woman. Two, never gloat over a fallen opponent. Three, never engage in fixed fights. And four, live and fight clean. Unlike Johnson, Lewis followed these strict guidelines whenever he was in public, and at every opportunity, his team would continually talk about Joe's modesty and sportsmanlike conduct. After signing with Jacobs, Lewis had some early success defeating giant Primo Carnera with an impressive six-round KO, then battering ex-champion Max Baer to a knockout in just four rounds in what was also the first million-dollar gate in over a decade. And just to emphasize an earlier point, in that same time frame, Lewis married his first wife, Marva Trotter, a black woman, also showing that, unlike Jack Johnson, he was safe for white America. This brings us to the most pivotal and miraculous time in the career of Joe Lewis, and what, in my estimation, makes him one of the most impactful athletes in the entire history of sports. Heading into his fight against Joe Lewis, Max Schmeling claimed to have identified a weakness in the champion. It may have included Lewis being distracted, enjoying his celebrity, which included indulging in the good life, golfing, and womanizing. Aside from those circumstances, it would end up being demonstrated in their championship fight that Schmeling saw and was able to take advantage of the fact that Lewis tended to drop his left hand after the jab. Schmeling was able to capitalize on this lapse in technique and continually landed a right hand counter over the top. Unable to adapt, Lewis was upset and stopped in the 12th round of the fight. After this triumphant win, Max Schmeling would become Hitler's poster boy for racial superiority. Lewis, in turn, needlessly to say, was devastated by this loss. Following this shocking setback, Joe went on an 11-fight win streak over a two-year period, regaining the heavyweight title, which set up the highly anticipated rematch with Schmeling. Finally, for the first time in 20 years, 
Lewis would not only represent the black community, but all of America. Democracy. You see, between the last fight and signing of the second fight, the political landscape had noticeably shifted. Hitler had begun to show his true colors and how dangerous he was to not only Eastern Europe, but America and the entire world. The stage had been set for a super fight that superseded all other events worldwide. The buildup was enormous, and come fight night, the 60,000 fans in attendance were joined by 70 million fans listening on the radio in the U.S. and more than 100 million worldwide. On that night, June 22, 1938, Joe Lewis wasn't a black fighter anymore. He became America. I think it was pretty obvious from the opening that that same Joe Lewis hadn't entered the ring that night, but a fighting machine programmed to do one thing, destroy Max Schmeling, did. A couple of moments stood out for me in the fight. One is the left hook Lewis landed in the, mid, in the center of Schmeling's midsection. It wasn't a typical body shot that lands and bounces off. Lewis really planted it. It seemed to sink into Schmeling's gut until it had nowhere else to go. It just stopped. Then going in for the kill, Lewis landed a right hand so hard that Schmeling's neck swiveled like a bobblehead. He followed that up with a body head combination that dropped Schmeling and left him unable to continue. As they raised Lewis's triumphant hand at the end of the two-minute, four-second mark of the first round, race completely disappeared, and Joe Lewis was a hero of the people. It was reported by some ringsiders afterwards that they could hear Schmeling scream out in pain as Lewis crashed shots into his midsection. Not surprisingly, Schmeling was later admitted to the hospital for 10 days, where it was discovered that Lewis had cracked two vertebrae and had caused a hemorrhage of the muscles in his lower back. From there, Joe Lewis cleaned out the heavyweight division. It was so dominant that his string of wins was labeled by sportscasters as the bum of the month club. In one stretch, Lewis even fought seven times in seven months. In all, Joe Lewis was victorious in 25 consecutive title defenses and had the longest reign as champion in boxing history. During that time in 1942, Lewis had also enlisted in the Marines where he was paid just $21 a month. This heroic and selfless act would unfortunately contribute a large part to Lewis's downfall. Throughout the war and after he continued to spend money like he was still fighting and owe the IRS $100,000, which grew to almost a million dollars toward the end of his career. Although there's some accountability on his part, much of the blame could be laid at the feet of his manager and promoter, but still a disheartening way for a champion to go out. You know, it's kind of unforgivable that the U.S. government couldn't see a person, a serviceman, a man who represented so much to America and chose to pursue his debt until his dying days as a hero that should be honored instead of a mark for their pursuit of justice. Ultimately, Lewis's former army buddy, Executive Reich Resnick, got him a job at Caesar's Palace as a guest host, a greeter, where Lewis's final days of life were plagued by depression, drugs, bouts of paranoia, which at one point he was hospitalized, institutionalized for, and ironically, ended up not in a dissimilar situation as his own father. In the end, Lewis died of heart failure on April 11, 1981, like many athletes, penniless and a shadow of their former selves. Maybe it's inevitable when you reach such mythological proportions as Lewis did, representing so much to so many during a time when it was needed most to fall from that pedestal. Yet, even if only for a brief moment in time, Lewis united races, fought for an entire country, and gave hope to the whole world. Fortunately for us, one poor sharecropper's son was inspired to express himself with a pair of boxing gloves instead of a violin bow. Thank you for watching this episode of Title Unboxed. If you're anything like me, you can never get too much boxing. So if you'd like to watch more episodes, you can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and on our Title Boxing YouTube page.